All right, welcome everyone to this Q and A. Dan, want to welcome everyone uh, to this Q and A. Few things, uh, few things came in. Um, let's see. Uh, we're gonna hit both of them. Uh, depends uh, how far I go here. Um, one, one question was that non-Jew is a non-Jew allowed to uh, follow astrology. Right, go to uh, you know read horoscopes, you know that type of thing. So simple explanation, and certainly for a Jew, it's forbidden. Right, trying to find out the future, even if someone knew how to do it. Right, are you sorcery? Should be forbidden for a Jew. Sorcery also should be forbidden for a non-Jew. But that really wasn't the question. It just sort of a preface, because here somebody. Um, was offered an astrology reading by a Jew. Now, my assumption is that yeah, this is a non-Jew, right? This is a non-Jew and shouldn't be done, right? 100% shouldn't be done, seemingly even for non-Jews. But the question was that this person who's a friend of theirs into astrology into Kabbalah, like into all these things, but not interested in conversion, right? Really wants to do whatever they want, okay? Not interested in rabbinical leadership, nothing, right? They want to learn what they want to do. They want to do what they want to do. So the question was, what? first of all, what can a person say, right? What should they say to them? And really, part of that question is, you know, do I have an obligation to say anything? Right? If you represent Torah and someone else doing all kinds of variants or whatever into all kinds of different things, is there an obligation when this person starts throwing out all kinds of beliefs not according to Torah? Right, so really the question is, in such a case, we come in contact with people, family, friends, right? We, we mentioned this before, but again, you know, I think, it's, I think it's a good question, bears repeating, and that is family, friends, what's our obligation? Is there an obligation to rebuke? Thor tells me clear. There's a verse in the Torah that says, We have an obligation, Jews. Right? We'll we'll talk about Jews for a second. Jews have an obligation to rebuke their fellow Jew. Now, some are going to say, we don't know how to do rebuke today. Right? This generation, certainly previous generations also, lost the art how to give rebuke. So some may say, okay, we don't we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to give proper rebuke. Maybe I'm exempt. We'll throw that out there. Maybe I'm exempt. Right? The reality is it doesn't really matter. Because even if a person's not going to listen, who says I don't have to give rebuke, even if they don't listen? So there, there are a lot of factors, right? Without going into all the nitty-gritty, there are a lot of factors. A lot of factors involved in it. Now, just because someone's not going to listen doesn't mean I don't have an obligation to say anything. Now, we'll make it very easy before we actually delve into the question. We'll make it very easy. The verse says, A Jew has an obligation to rebuke a fellow Jew. Whether they're going to listen or not doesn't matter. Have an obligation to rebuke them. When they're doing the wrong thing. So, by definition, if I have an obligation to rebuke a Jew, who says I have an obligation to rebuke an Anjou? We're going to be very specific in the verse. You surely have to give rebuke to Amisecho, to your people. What does your people mean in the vernacular? The Jews got no obligation to rebuke you as a Jew. 
So that would mean by definition, I don't have an obligation to rebuke non-Jews. And the only reason I would have an obligation seemingly to rebuke Jews is because maybe what I'm going to say is going to bring them back. It's going to bring them back into the fold to keep Torah and mitzvah. Now, what's the only reason I have an obligation to do so? First of all, the Torah tells me so. Right? But the second reason is, what's the, what's the obligation for a Jew to reach out to other Jews? Because the Talmud tells me, call Yisrael Arabian said, listen, every Jew is responsible for another Jew. And we see that explicitly in the world. Why? Because if a Jew does something wrong, whether the secular religious, all Jews get blamed. Hitler, Yemach, Shemoy, Vizichroy, may his name be blotted out. He didn't care how much Jewish blood you had. If there was Jewish blood in your family, you deserved to be wiped out. Now, if an Italian, we've used this example before, if an Italian in Brooklyn, right, does, does something wrong, even something terrible, people are going to say, we're going to burn down Italy. No more cannoli. We're going to burn down Italy. Never happened. Right? Chinese person, black person, you know, etc. We're going to say, kill all the blacks, kill all the Chinese. Right? Obviously, that would be racism 101. Right? But that doesn't happen. You say, okay, someone's a bad egg, did something wrong. You're not going to wipe out or try and wipe out the entire nation of that people. You're not going to call all them out. I mean, you wouldn't do it anyway. Right? But you're not going to call them all out and say, all Chinese people X. All black people X. Won't happen. Why is it it's done by Jews? And we're one one thousand, probably less, of the world's population. Cares about Jews in general. You look at the land of Israel, no bigger than the size of the state of New Jersey. Twenty-two Arab states, you know, want to carve up this land, you know, give it to the Arabs and want to destroy the Jewish people. All for a piece of land, and fighting over this land for years, centuries. Right, and all the crusades, all these things. Who cares? <laughs> One strip of land. Right, Jewish people have been condemned more in the UN. I mean, we can make fun of the UN, but you know, we'll just throw this out there. Been condemned more than any other nation combined. Over one strip of land. The Jewish people are one one thousandth of the world's population. Why is everybody always picking on me? Why? Because you say anti-Semitism exists because Ace of Atiago, right? And that'll never end till the Messiah comes. True. But again, we have to ask the question, why are we singled out more than anyone else? Right? Why is it one Jew, again, secular religious, does something wrong? Even something minor. All Jews get thrown under the bus. What's the reason? Because all Jews are interrelated. We're all connected. No other nation's connected like this. So when we look at it in that way, and we're all connected and someone makes a mistake, everyone gets blamed. All the Jewish people get blamed. You say it's not fair. You're right. Maybe it's not fair. But see, that's the only reason to do Jewish outreach. That's the point. Why are we going to bring Jews back to Torah? What's our obligation? There's another obligation, right? To let your fellow Jew. So you want to bring him back. You want to save his soul, so to speak. Sounds like a Christian thing, but we want to save Jewish souls also. Right? No question. So either you tell me I'm returning their lost soul to them, or we're all interrelated, fine. But who says, right? We'll just throw this out there also because we've spoken about it a number of times. Who says I have an obligation to reach out to the Anjis? Right? We'll get back to the original question in a second. Now, someone's made the statement a number of times. 
And they said the Jews are the chosen nation. We're supposed to be light into the nations. So you have an obligation to teach non-Jews. My cash. What's the connection? Just because we are the chosen people, that means I got to go proselytize to the non-Jews. I got to go stick up signs and, you know, right near every church all over saying, no, I lost, ram it down their throat. Who says? Who says I got no obligations, no source for it? None. One of the longest responses my Rebbe's written. Right? And he says there's no early commentator, later commentary. Talmud doesn't say it. No source. <laughs> but some non-Jew comes out there and says, I got a source. You know better than my Rebbe. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. Can't even read Hebrew. Right? So you're going to come out and say, I got a, I got a source. The Jews are the chosen nation. We're right into the nation. That's beautiful. So, <laughs> what does that have to do with non-Jews? So we're going to say, but how non-Jews got to know about the Noahid laws? You know how they're going to learn? Because in the end of days, they're going to come up to a Jew and say, I want to learn. I want to know what it means to be a non-Jew in this world. That means I have to go out to them. You're going to say, but it's not fair. How are they going to know? I got people coming, you know, coming to me from Ghana, from, sorry, from Ghana, from Uganda, from Bangladesh, Egypt, all over the world, India, you know, when they have internet service, all over the world. And people want to know what it means to be a Jew or means to be an orange. You know why? Because this is universal. These are universal laws. So since the Jewish people are chosen, that means I have to go out there to teach someone something that's obvious. But what about the people in India, the worshiping cows? What do you want from me? Didn't God give them a brain? They're not mentally challenged. They're misguided. 100% misguided. Cows are not the brightest animals in the world. They want to worship the cow? Okay, it's their choice. Totally their choice. I have to try and convince them why not to worship a cow. That's a little bit much. Everyone's got free choice. But see, these laws are universal. If they're universal, someone's got to figure it out on their own. I have been brainwashed. And you lived in Russia, you know, in the time of my, you've been waving that red flag. Not my fault. You'll say it's not the person's fault. They were brainwashed. Okay, but God gave them a brain, right? Gave them the ability to understand things, make decisions. Because when God breathed in the spirit of life, as the Torah tells in the book of Genesis, he gave us the Aramaic translation is, he gave us a Ruach Memalolo, the ability to speak. The reason why the animals also do that. And if I was Dr. Doolittle, I could speak like the animals, which I can't. Used to be some people could understand, you know, birds and what they say and all that. All right, we don't have that today. So animals also have understanding. Yeah, but they're programmed. They're programmed DNA. You could tell me they have the ability to make decisions. They can eat. They cannot eat. True. They're programmed. We're different. We have the ability to make decisions. Good decisions. Bad decisions. We have that ability. So if we have that ability, and after 120 years, person gets upstairs and God says, hey, what happened to being an orphan? Because I never knew about it. What? You didn't know you weren't allowed to steal? You weren't allowed. You weren't. You don't know. You weren't allowed to try and you know, play with creation. You weren't allowed to do it. These are obvious things, right? So I, I have to be out there trying to convince the non-Jews of the world, you know, to be no odds. They come to me. They want to know what it means. Different issue. Because they're not, you know, they're not all intertwined like Jews are. So I got a much greater obligation to work with Jews. They come to me. They want to understand the different issue. Oh, but someone half a brain comes out and says, you know, the, you know, the Torah says, and I'll give them credit, at least they quoted it right. That the Torah says, you know what? You're a light into nations. And if we were really the true light into nations, everything would be great. There'd be no war, be no famine. We'd have a base on Mikdash. We've sinned, we've made mistakes. We have to lead. That's true. We have an obligation. We have an obligation to teach the world. But who says I have to run around finding people to do that? All but the Torah says, thank you very much. 
I can also tell you what the Torah says. Right? But being a light on the nations doesn't mean that's my obligation. Doesn't mean that. There's no source for that. Right? I keep hearing the same thing over and over and over again. But you have your light on the nations. Again, who cares? You're right. Does that mean I have to proselytize the non-Jews to keep their mitzvahs? No. They want to worship cows? You know, worship, you know, you know, God, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and everybody else in between? Okay. I have to convince them? <laughs> Why do I have to convince them? They want to go on the wrong path. That's their choice. That's their choice. So, based on that, I would say very simply, if the Torah tells me, I have an obligation to rebuke my own people. De facto, that means I don't have an obligation at all to rebuke other non Jews or to rebuke non Jews in general. It's only my people. They want to go on the wrong way. Okay. I have to rebuke them. You know, someone comes to me and says, Well, you know, what do you think about this? It's wrong. Okay, you want to tell me why? Yeah, maybe I'll give you some reasons why. I got to sit there and convince you why? You want to misread, misinterpret verses? Okay. You want to turn it into a pretzel so it's under understandable? Okay. I have to stop you? Who says? I have to rebuke my own people. I have to know how to give rebuke. And even if they don't, even if I can't, I don't know how to give rebuke. So what? Maybe I still have an obligation. Right? It seems like I still have an obligation to give rebuke anyway. Even if they're not going to listen. But who says a non-Jew has to give rebuke to a non-Jew? Be one thing, a Jew to a Jew. You know, or maybe we'll throw out the idea of Jew to a non-Jew, even though that's not true. But, who's, but the question is, does a non-Jew have an obligation to give a non-Jew rebuke? Who says? That would be a logical thing. I don't think it would be so logical. I wouldn't even say it's a moral imperative. Right? We're not out there. Jews are not here to start up with non-Jews. That's one of the things that, that the rabbis had a problem with America Han Hashem Yikam Dumbo. God should avenge his blood. What was the problem? They didn't necessarily say we disagree with your theory. We disagree with your Torah. Right? That wasn't the major issue. The major issue was he went out there and started up with non-Jews. That was the issue. You want to rebuke Jews They don't know anything? Go ahead. Right? Not everyone in Jewish outreach will tell you to do that. Right? To be that strong. Throw them under the bus. You know? Not everyone's going to say that's a good way to try and bring Jews back. Some people think it is a good way. Okay? Right? But the vast majority of, of rabbinic authorities were against what Rev Khan did. Because he was starting up with people he shouldn't have started up with. Now, based on that, so now I should be out there <laughs> trying to convince non-Jews what we're starting up with them for. Let me work with Jews. Plenty of Jews don't know anything. Start with them. Definitely start with them. And start with non-Jews. That was a claim. That was one of the claims against him. He started up with non-Jews. No reason to start up with non-Jews. You know, I get it. You want to be strong. You know, you want to give over God's Torah. You want to rebuke them. Who says? <laughs> Was there like an obligation to rebuke them? Right? Everyone came out against him that way. Again, they may not be disagreeing with what he said. We're not saying what he said necessarily wasn't true. That was not how you engage. That was the knock against him. That's not how you engage. So, so now we'll get back to the original question. This person's a non-Jew. Right? There may be a Jew in training, bro. They may be a non-Jew, right? Does a non-Jew have to give rebuke to a non-Jew? That would be the simple answer, no. Right, we just answered that. They don't have an obligation. 
Now, what if, what if they were both Jews? All right, we'll make it a little more dicey. All right, we'll make it a little more dicey. What if they're both non-Jews? Sorry, let's say better. What if they were both Jews? This person, right, into astrology. This person into Kabbalah. They have no interest in listening to the rabbi. They wouldn't do whatever they want. Now, you know and I know, most likely, and this person knows, they're never going to listen. No matter what you say. They're not going to listen. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have an obligation to rebuke them. There is a responsibility, even if they're not going to listen. There is a responsibility to rebuke, even if we don't know how to rebuke today. You know, I had someone a number of months ago, you know, all up in arms, you know, about the fact that the kids aren't Jewish. The father's Jewish, the mother's not Jewish. So they're like, that's nothing to do with my kids. Of course it does. You know, offense. They didn't do anything wrong. You did something wrong. You went to marriage. It's your problem, not their problem. But there's reality. Oh, you're this, you're that, you're the other. Okay, you can say whatever you want. It's wrong. <laughs> Marrying an Andrew is wrong. That's it. You don't like it? My people would say, go eat Kogo. So what? You don't like it. What the Torah says. And the Torah is anti pig. You don't like that either. Okay. Anti rabbit. You like to eat rabbits. I don't know. You know. Torah may have a lot of issues with a lot of things. Maybe just an image problem. Could be. But is the Torah true or it's not? It doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> it matters for a lot of reasons. But okay, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. Subject gets changed. All right. So what happened? So they know, obviously, what my position is. They don't like it. They can say I'm a fanatic. They can say whatever. My position is pretty clear. Right? Is that, did that change them? No. Do we have a whole discussion about it? Why? No. Because I know they're not going to listen. Right? Nonetheless, still have to tell the truth. Still have to try and throw things in there, give them rebuke. Maybe they'll come back. Maybe they'll think about it. Maybe not. So, first question here was, what can I say? <laughs> Maybe there's nothing to say. You know, what are you going to argue over here? They want to learn astrology. They want to do astrology. They don't want to listen to the rabbi. You know, they're not interested in Noah Hyde Law. So what am I going to say? So I would say, probably say nothing. Nothing's going to happen. Right? But if you have an obligation to rebuke and you're having this conversation, they're going to stand up for the Torah. You got to say, the Torah is against astrology. The Torah doesn't allow you to play with Ouija boards. To try and know the future, even if these people could do it. Right? Even if there are people out there not to read the stars. Sure, there are people out there that could. Right? Even if they could do it, who says I should tap into it? Who says I'm allowed to try and know the future? The Torah says I shouldn't do it. Comes under sorcery, right? Sorcery, astrology, whole bunch of things. So obviously you're in contact with this person and they keep telling you, yeah, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, right? So now you can say something. So, yeah, they want to run to Kabbalah. They probably can't read the alphabet. You know, so you tell them, you know, how could you learn Kabbalah? You know, you can't run before you learn how to crawl. You can't learn calculus if you don't know algebra or trigonometry. So why you got to learn something much higher that you're never going to understand because you don't have the basics that you can answer. Right? So they say, I feel I have an obligation to say something. Right? If you were a Jew, the other person was a Jew. 100% you have an obligation to say something. They can make fun of you. They can say all kinds of things. You know, you tell them the way it is. And if you don't have enough information, either find it or send them to somebody. 
who can give them the information. I, they don't want to listen. Okay. The only question how far you have to go. Now, some people would say, you know, they come to Torah mitzvahs, even if they don't want to listen to you, they come to it much later. And they say, why didn't you tell me before? Why didn't you show me this before? Well, it's obvious, why not? Because you weren't interested. All right, if I kept spamming you with different things, you wouldn't look at anything. They said, yeah, but how do you know I, might, I wouldn't? Maybe I would have. Right? So there could be something that's always nagging at us. Maybe I should have gone further. Maybe I should have done something more. Right? I also have this, you know, with a certain family. And, and I, you know, I basically gave up. I basically gave up because you can't bring the person to drink if they don't want to drink. What am I going to do? Treat, keep trying to hammer the point? It's a moot point. You know, it doesn't mean you give up. It doesn't necessarily mean you should give up. Right? The question is how far it goes. So in this case, you're in conversation with this person. You should say something. 100% you should say something. If it's a Jew and a Jew. If it's a Jew and a non-Jew, who says you got an obligation? If it's a non-Jew and a non-Jew, I wouldn't have an obligation at all. So they want to learn astrology. Let them learn astrology. I have an obligation to rebuke them. Listen, if you're having a conversation and you say, okay, you know, okay, you know, it's forbidden, you shouldn't do it even for non Jews, blah, 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 you know, and they reject it, you know, how far do you have to go? I don't think you have to go much further. Right? I don't have to, you know, in, in this case, it's a little bit easier. Why? Because it's, it's two non Jews. First of all, a non Jew doesn't have an obligation to try and convince another non Jew. But even if they would, even if I would throw out the idea, I'll be generous today. I'll throw out the idea. Maybe they have an obligation to do so. You have the conversation, they don't listen. They listen, I get so many books. I can send you to this site, that site. They're like, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. At that point, your obligation is done. You don't have to go further than that. Right? If we had an obligation, a Jew and a Jew, if there was an, you know, an obligation over here to run after the person, continually try and send stuff, it doesn't matter how much they hate you or they hate Judaism for it, they have an obligation to keep doing it. Right? I don't think everyone would agree with this. And, and, uh, and I think there's a very simple reason. First of all, they're going to look at you like you're proselytizing, which... You know, you're trying to save their soul. You're bringing them back. It's not proselytization. That would be okay, right, for, for doing Jewish outreach. But if the more you do, the more they're going to say, I, you know, I don't have anything to do with Judaism. I don't have anything to do with Orthodox Jews. You know, and they're going to hate Judaism more. So at a certain point, you know, you don't have to anymore. You know, every once in a while, you could send something, send an email, send a link, send, you know. But to do it on a constant basis, you know, someone will tell, tell you, you know, like someone told me, they're like, get off your pedestal. Get off your high pedestal. Well, I'm going to waste my time. No, I made my point. I mean, I over, overly made my point. They don't want to hear anymore. Okay, point, you know, so now, you know, months later, I should go back to that because I have an obligation. On the other hand, Maybe I do. Maybe try and do it this way. Try and do it that way. You never give up. Right? But the world of Jewish outreach, what do we say? You plant the seed. That's what you do. You plant the seed. And eventually that seed may grow or it won't. Well, the cousin of my wife, or the only religious cousin she has, that, you know, we say propaganda never goes to waste. Right, you throw out, I, you throw out ideas, send them information. Maybe every so often, send them a link to something. And that's it. But it never goes to waste. But to keep hammering someone, they don't want to listen. You know, you can try and invite them to things, other things. Okay, right within reason. You know, but after a certain point. 
you know, you do it much lighter. You don't keep hammering them left and right. Not going to do anything. Right, Stephen, he's not going to do anything. Maybe it will, but most likely it probably won't. But you leave the door open. Right? It's not about hammering people. They're not, you know, you know, today's Ashkenazim, Spartan, it's a little bit easier because they, they have, you know, they're more traditional. But Ashkenazim, they don't care. <laughs> they just don't care about anything. So if they don't care about anything, what am I trying to convince them of? They don't want to listen. So you plant seats. But sometimes, let's say you have a conversation with someone and they throw something out, that's when you pounce. You don't sit there and call them and pounce. You know, you're having a conversation, something comes up there. So in this case, that's what you do. So, so, so you have a conversation, you know, and this person says, yeah, yeah I'm into astrology, I'm into Kabbalah. You know, I'm not going to listen to what the rabbis say. That's the time to say something. Or if you don't have anything to say, you're caught off guard, you contact them afterwards. You follow up. Like, oh, you brought this up, you know, whatever. Then you have a conversation. You know, and then they'll say, well, maybe we can agree to disagree, whatever. Do I have to go further than that? Maybe a little bit. Much more than that? I don't think so. Then you do it more subtly. You say, oh, I read this great article. Maybe you like it. You know, we send it to them. They may listen to it. They may not. Like someone told me. They said, oh, life after death. Can you explain that to me in 30 seconds? I mean, I'm good. I'm not that good. 30 seconds, I said, I'll send you a link. Did they watch it? Probably not. You know, so how much further do I have to go? Again, I do have something nagging at me. Certain people, they just sort of gave up on. But I don't think it's my obligation anymore. It's painful. But can't bring them to drink. But if you're already in the middle of a conversation or you're in contact every so often, this is what the person says. Yeah, bam, you hammer them. Then you say something. You're not running after them. I mean, if it's two non-Jews, for sure you have no obligation. But if you're having a conversation and this comes up, sure you should say something. And, and you know, it might get heated. They, they obviously may disagree. They obviously don't want to see your point of view. Okay. Right? The only, the only thing we're asking over here is how far does it go? Now, after this conversation, what happens? First of all, I'm not interested. I want to do what I want to do. So a few days later, whatever, you're talking, you know, and it comes up again. They bring it up. The, the question is, after that conversation, do you have an obligation to run after them and try and keep convincing them and giving them a rebuke? At a certain point, you don't. Certainly for non-Jews, you, you don't have that. Might be a good thing to do, but no obligation. The question is for a Jew, how far it goes. Right? Not 100% clear to me how far that should go. Because the reality is, the more pressure you put on, the worse it'll be. Maybe someone will come around eventually. Maybe. Right? But most likely, they probably say, listen, you want to have a conversation? I don't want to hear anything about God or religion. You mention God or religion, don't even talk to me. Then you got to make a choice. <laughs> Yeah, you want to have something to do with them. You don't want to have something to do with them. All right, but that's what's going to happen, most likely. But in the middle, you know, if you have a conversation with such a person, you know, and they say something off the wall or something against story, yeah, you should definitely answer them. You shouldn't, you know, if you have an answer, you know, now you get an opportunity. The question is, after the opportunity comes, then what? Right, that's really the question. So if you're in contact with somebody to answer the question in a roundabout way, and if you're going through that, you have the person on the phone, in person, yeah, then you hammer them. 100% you hammer them right there. You know, if it comes up again, again, you know, you stick up for Torah. After that, do I have to run after them? Seemingly not. Every once in a while, you say, listen, I read this article. So off the side, maybe be interested in sending it to them. That you could do. But if you're going to constantly hammer someone, they're not going to be interested. Certainly most Ashkenazim today do not want, they're not going to want to hear. 
It's very simple why, because they're very apathetic. Why are they apathetic? Because of all the garbage they eat. Because it affects their soul. All the trade they eat affects their soul. They don't want to hear at all. Right? That doesn't necessarily exempt me from rebuke. Let's make that clear. Just because they do this and they think this, whatever, doesn't mean I don't have an obligation to rebuke. You have to know where, when. And, you know, not so simple. I tell you, what's, uh, whatever. It's, it's a big topic. Big topic. Someone asked, is it permissible for JITs to, research, to receive money gifts from Christian relatives for, for December 25th? You know, if a person's not Jewish, and they say, you know, Mary Kratzmach, whatever, you know, they give you money. It's not idolatry. They're not saying we sanctify this money for JC. And it represents everything he believes in. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, that might be an issue. That might be an offshoot of idolatry. But over here, you know, I don't think it matters. I don't think it would be an issue. If you were to tell me you'd be by somebody's house and it's December 25th and they're exchanging gifts, yeah, that might be a problem. That definitely might be a problem. Right? Even though, technically speaking, gift giving is not idolatry. Right? Okay, it's a pagan holiday. True. You know, at the end of the day, even Someone, you know, someone has a tree. Tree's not idolatry. People are not bowing down to the tree. At least, not that I know of. If they bow down to the tree, yeah, that might be an issue. But it's not part of the practice. You know, and most people that do it, it's just, you know, that's their custom. That's what they do. Maybe they go to midnight mass. You know, maybe something on Easter. You know, maybe some are more religious, less religious. But the reality is it's not a religious thing person. I mean, I'm not saying that they have a tree. You know, obviously that you know that's a problem. You know, and being around where they're going to be giving gifts on that day, yeah, that's a problem. That's definitely a problem. But if someone were to give you money, give a certificate, whatever, before or after, and they say it's really for that, I don't know if it matters. I wouldn't say it matters. Right? Why why should it? Because you say they're doing it for the sake of the holiday. Right? You'll say it's for the sake of the holiday. I don't know. If they would say explicitly, if they would say explicitly, I am giving you this money in the name of JC for that day. That might be a problem. That is probably a problem. But in general, even if they even if they give the money and they say that's what it's for, I don't know if that's a problem. Right? Someone says isn't what the tree represents a bad thing. Yeah. I didn't say it's a good thing. I just said it's not idolatry. Right? They're not worshiping the tree. That's the difference. You know, if somebody would put the tree up and they're worshiping the tree, yeah, that might be a problem. Going to their house when they have the tree up. Right, you'll say, but what about people that have JC hanging around in their house? Yeah. <laughs> it might also be an issue. I don't think you can't go in the house. But you see, there is a question. The Torah tells me you're not allowed to bring abomination into your house. Right? You're not allowed to bring idolatry into your house. So now that's clear by a Jew. Question is, does that apply to an Anji? A non-Jew is forbidden when it comes to idolatry to do anything that's idolatrous. Bowing down to it, sacrificing to it, any of these things. It's idolatrous. If this thing is not necessarily idolatrous, right? It's not like it's the holy wafer, so to speak. So it's not the holy wafer. They don't worship it. So they don't worship it. I'm not going to say it's a good thing. Right, but they don't worship it. If they would have crosses in their house, different places, yeah, I wouldn't pray in such a place. You know, if it's hanging up. 
But who says I'm not allowed to go in their house? Be allowed to go in their house. There is a question if they, if on themselves, if they're allowed to put these things up or not in their house. Right? Especially if they don't worship it. Not everybody worships the cross. Right? There's a difference of opinion when the cross somebody wears. Right? Is that an issue? And the issue would be if it's worshipped or not. If it's not worshipped, then it's a problem. Someone asked, what if it came wrapped in a card with JC on it? They're not worshipping it. I ask you, I'll ask you a stronger question. The question that was asked, what if you have plates? What if you have plates with the design of JC all around the plates? Are you allowed to eat off the plates? Now, we're out to religious. People say, no, throw out the plates. Break them. Right? But what, what's the problem? Or, what, sorry, let's say better. What's the issue? The issue is, got J.C. around. So he represents idolatry. So who says I should eat off the plate? Who says I should be allowed to eat off the plate with that design? But the question is, is that design worshipped? And the answer is no. When they made that design on the plate, they didn't make it to be worshipped. It's a theme. <laughs> it's a Christian theme on the plate. Very good. But who says it's worshipped? If they worship the plate, then I would agree. If they worship the plate, can't use it. That's idolatry. Right, if they worship the picture on the card, which nobody does, right? I mean, can't imagine anybody does, right? It's a card, fine. Hallmark making more money, no, not an issue. Why not? Because it's not worship, it has to be something that's that's used for idolatry, or the thing itself is idolatry. Right? Otherwise, otherwise, there's really nothing wrong with it. Now, the question would be, you know, the question of this thing with the, with the tree. You're right. It's not a good thing. I would agree. It's just not idolatry. I'll give you another example. Right here in Israel on Sukkot, some people put these flashing lights in their Sukkot. Green and red lights. Where are they from? Christmas decorations. Now, Israelis don't know the difference. They have no idea. So to put them up, is there a problem? No. Why not? They didn't worship it. Ah, but that's what they use it for. Fine. But it's really, they have no idea. They have no idea. They just think they're nice lights, flashing lights. Now, for anyone who's American, living in Israel, they would never do that because they know what it represents. But again, technically speaking, is it idolatry? No. But it's used for a pagan thing, but it's not idolatry. I wouldn't put it in my house. Right? I wouldn't wrap it around, you know, a bush outside when I light my Hanukkah menorah. I wouldn't do that. But then we speak, there's nothing wrong with it. Right? It's what it represents. 100% is what it represents. Right, so we won't do it because that's what it represents. But again, there are two things here. One thing is, is it idolatry or not? And even if it's not idolatry, why should I have it in the first place? Right, so I think the second question is much more crucial. Right, it really hits home. I had someone ask me once a while ago, probably a few years ago. You know, they have old decorations that their kids made, you know, for, for the tree. They said, uh, are they allowed to keep it? Sentimental value. They know what it represents. Question is, sentimental value. Are they allowed to have it? I said, you should get rid of it. Shouldn't have any recollection of this stuff. 
Now, technically speaking, nothing wrong with it, really. It's what it represents. That's the problem. Right? That's the problem. Someone asked, don't some communities have a custom design? I'm not studying Torah yet. It's really by Hungarian, Hungarian Jews. You know, what do they do at night? They play chess. I don't know, checkers, whatever. They don't learn Torah. Because they're afraid of the power of that impurity of that thing. So it's called Nitto. Right, let me put it out there. Um, oops. It's called Nittelnach. That's what it's called. Um, or it's called Nittel in general. Um, so some so some will say if you're of Hungarian descent because of the power of impurity of that day, don't learn Torah. It'll have a negative effect. Everybody else will say the opposite. Specifically on that day, the greatest amount of impurity, I should definitely be learning more Torah. To offset it. All right? So therefore, the vast majority of rabbis today say it's not a problem. I'm not saying it's across the board. There are some that hold. Right? Hungarians in general. I think it's Hungarian. That's they themselves will not learn on that night for that reason. But they're in the minority. Let's make clear, they are in the minority. Everyone else learns. Maybe they learn even more because of the impurity. The offset it. Nothing wrong with that. Again, I'm not saying there's not an opinion like that. Right? Make a good point. That's true. There is such an opinion. Yeah, we don't hold that way. Right, the vast, major, vast majority of rabbinical authorities don't hold that. It's just the opposite. They want you to learn more Torah. You know, one thing we have to keep in mind with all this is that it's not just, you know, the, the Torah tells them not allowed to go in the way of non Jews. So when a Jew can, when a non Jew converts, really they were a non Jew before, but now, now that they became a Jew, what about all the stuff they had before? So all that stuff you should get rid of. Now, someone will tell me, I want to keep around a New Testament so I can answer up other people. If you already have, it's one thing. I wouldn't tell people to go out and buy one, right, or keep them around. But if someone's going to use it for something else, okay. Right? The reality is it shouldn't have. But if a person wants to use it as a reference in order to answer up other people, you know, technically I would say there's probably nothing wrong with it. You know, if someone to go out and buy it, though, that would be a different issue. <laughs> Use the toilet paper, yeah. Take a take a take a match, can burn it, right? But the the it, you know, if a person's going to destroy it, you got to make sure that it gets destroyed, that no one else can use it. You say, "I'll give it to my cousin." No, I don't have to get any benefit from it. No one's allowed to get benefit from it. it has to be destroyed, right? You bury it, you rip it up. Use it for toilet paper, whatever. Doesn't matter if it's written in Hebrew. Right? Let's say they have the Old Testament with it. It's, it's Hebrew and God's name there. Still, you can rip it up and burn it, use it as toilet paper. Why? There's no holiness. There's no holiness there. Because when they're put together, you know, no difference than if a heretic wrote a Sefer Torah. Right? A heretic writes a Sefer Torah. What do you do? What's the halach? You burn it. Oh, but there are holy names there. Nope. The names of God that are used there are not holy. Because the person writing it is not holy. Right? He's not doing it for the right reason. So, therefore, that's no holiness. I can burn it. That's my obligation. You know, a person may say, it's got God's name in it. Yeah, but you have to have certain intention when you write it. You have to have fear of heaven, this and that. They're heretics. So a heretic who writes a, a safer Torah. We write the Torah scroll, you burn it. That's all. New Testament, no different. It's got Hebrew in it. No one cares. God's name in it. Could have hundred different names of God in there. So what? Burn it. Use the toilet paper. Whatever. Right. But one thing we have to keep in mind is that things from our past that aren't good, we get rid of. We try to the best of our ability. So all these things, whether they're crosses, they're 
their their books, New Testament, whatever, get rid of everything. Right? Destroyed. It's got to be destroyed. Someone else can use it. Now, if it's something that's not really a religious artifact, you say it's got sentimental value, like the bells their kids made to put on trees. So maybe you find a soft spot. You know, you find a soft spot in me. I'll say, okay, I get it. But you still have to burn it. You still have to get rid of it. You don't want that remembrance around. You don't, you know, you don't want that impurity in your house. I, it's not idolatry, it's what it represents. 100 percent what it represents. So we gotta be careful. You know, having any of these things from the past. A lot of these things from the past aren't good. When we talk about family and friends, that's how we started with all this. And it doesn't matter. You know, I spoke about this yesterday in Tanakh talk, or two days ago, on Sunday. I forget what day of the week it is. On Sunday, right? Toxic relationships. I just actually put it up on my page. It doesn't matter if they're family. It could be parents, it could be sibling, it could be a God forbidden person's child. Right? Who says? Who says, you know, that that chain is not going to be broken? Person becomes religious, family may not accept it. They may put conditions, they may this. Okay, you know, you got an obligation to guard yourself, guard your family. You got to lay down the ground rules. They don't want to hold by it. You can say, okay, I agree to disagree, but these are the parameters. These are the parameters. Right? More than 30 years, almost 30 years ago, I got married. So, though my wife's two sisters you went to marry, not a chance will come to the wedding. Never. We made that clear. One sister into married. It happened. I was living in the States at the time. We didn't go. Caused the whole thing. Can't you find a leniency? No. We told you this 30 years ago. 20 years ago. Whatever it was. Oh, they weren't happy about it. We didn't back down. Made it clear. There are certain parameters, certain things you don't go beyond. All right, that's what you got to do. But see, the most important thing is you got to be consistent. Because if they catch you and not being consistent, they'll rip you to shreds. So at least, you know, you got to be consistent. You got to set up boundaries. And if they're not interested in holding by the boundaries, then you got to make a choice. You know, people will say, if I keep hearing all the time, blood is thicker than water. Like, family is the most important thing ever. Yeah. And if they're heretics, you know, and they bully me and they say all kinds of negative things, why do I have to have a connection to them? You know, what's the, what's the benefit? Because they're family. And what happens if they intermarry? Then they're not family anymore. Unless they repent, which is going to be hard unless their spouse, you know, convert. But family... In many ways, it's going to go by the wayside. It doesn't have to be. But a lot of times, people are just not that open-minded. They're not that open-minded. The person has to be prepared. I'm not saying 100% across the board is going to happen. But many times, it does, and people have to be prepared for that. I think a lot of people understand, because they've gone through it. But again, you have an obligation... 100% to guard yourself, guard your family. And if they're going to abuse that and go against it and, you know, try and do things you don't want them to do, you know, then you have to have a conversation. Say, listen, this is what we believe. This is what we do. You know, I don't have to talk about it. We don't have to have a discussion about it. But, you know, we have certain red lines. And those red lines are not going to move. So, if you want to have a relationship, you don't talk about this, that, and the other. You don't do X, Y, or Z. You want to abide by it? Great. You don't want to abide by it? You know, not much you can do. You know, they can say things, they can this, that. You, you have to show what the bottom line is. And if you compromise here and compromise there and they call you on it, yeah, it's going to be a problem. You got to be consistent. 
You lose friends along the way. That's the way it goes. So what's more important? Having friends and family or properly serving God? You can say, I want everything. You don't get everything. You don't get everything. You know, and you may lose a lot in the process. But everyone will probably agree that even if they lose, they don't really lose. Because now they're on the right path. They're going in the right direction. It's more important than anything else. That's true. But it doesn't come without self-sacrifice. And that's also part of the test. It's also part of the test. God's going to say, okay, you want to be in this path? You have to go against everybody just like Abraham. They say, but I'm not Abraham. <laughs> I also said that. People told me that. I said, I'm not Abraham, but that's what you have to do. And you may have to chuck everything away. Everybody doesn't have to be that extreme. But in the end, that may end up happening. So we have to be okay with that. Doesn't mean it's easy. But I think most people understand. They understand what the truth is. There is, there is a lot of self-sacrifice. And one thing that comes with self-sacrifice is you may end up losing family and friends. It may happen. But you, you got you to gotta be careful influences. You know, influences are very strong. Whether by work, whether by family, by friends. My people say this many times. Even having normal, quote-unquote, conversations with these people cause damage. Cause damage to you. Why? How they speak, what they say. What? I can never speak to them? Certain things you have no choice. Right? There's certain things we have no choice. The question is how we deal with it. You know, you speak to someone and they start cursing left and right. I didn't tell them to do that. But I had to speak to them for whatever reason. If I work with them, their family, whatever. And they start cursing like a truck driver. No offense, they truck drivers out there. They start cursing left and right and saying all kinds of negative things. You're not in control of that. You are not in control of that at all. But you just have to get that out of your mind. And say, wow, this person speaks like a truck driver. Oh, it's gross. And you got to say, thank God. You know, if you were Jew, you'd say, ah, oh, thank God I'm not a non-Jew. If you're a non-Jew, you'd say, thank God I'm a Jew in training. Or thank God I'm a Noah. Right? What's the quick way you explain it? You tell them you're a Jew in training. You're learning about Judaism. And, you know, and you're going to convert. Right? So people want to call you Jewish. Okay. <laughs> you know you're not Jewish. Fine. I don't think it's a big deal. Right? How do you explain something like that in five minutes? It's very hard. Most people don't have the attention span anyway. You know, it used to be people had the attention span of a commercial, right? A commercial 20, 30 years ago was about six minutes, longer than that, right? Way back. It's like six minutes. Today, commercials are much shorter and they're just flashing images left and right. You basically only have about 15 seconds before you lose it. Maybe even seven. So you can try and explain it quickly, and probably within 30 seconds, you're going to lose them anyway, because they're not going to be interested, and you move on. Right? There's no easy way to explain it. The only thing you can say is, well, we believe God gave the Torah. I was born a non-Jew, so I have to go through conversion. But if I don't want to go through conversion. I have to go through universal laws. And there are certain universal laws. There are, you know, some say there are 50, some say there are 60. And I have to hold by the universal laws, and even if I don't convert, it doesn't matter. Right? So that was like a seven-second explanation. Then you say, where'd they come from? Okay, then it gets a little more detail. But if you don't get it out quick, you, you lost them. You know, how do you explain? How do you explain what happens life after death in 30 seconds? If I would have started going on, I would have been cut off in, if I was lucky, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. They would have given me more than 10 seconds. I already knew that. So I said, okay. I said, I'll send you a link. I sent them a two-hour two hour video, which I'm sure they didn't watch. I said, I'll send you a link if, you, if you're interested. I don't know if they watched it. They didn't watch it. You're not going to get that far. You can try and explain it, you know, within 10 seconds, 15 seconds. 
You give over what I just said, then, but that's it. You're not going to have much more time. Right? And they're going to say, oh, but you're really Jewish. <laughs> okay. How are you going to explain that you have to go through conversion? How are you going to explain all the laws you have to... They're not, they're not holding it. They're not going to... You know, if they already ask you, you have to say something. But you're not going to get that. I don't think you're going to get that. Fargas, you know, people make that wrong conclusion. Oh, you're already Jewish. All right, well, how much you really have to know? You know, the more the more you get in the conversation, the more lost they are. I'm not, I'm not saying don't have the conversation if someone asks you. And don't just say, oh, forget it. It'll take me too long to explain. I would say try to explain to them. You know, you only have a certain amount of time. You know, and if they cut you off and say, well, you're already Jewish anyway, <laughs> you're going to sit there and try and convince them. God gave the Torah Mount Sinai. It was only to the Jews. Now the Jews wanted it. Now the Jews didn't want it. You go through the whole thing, you lose it. I don't think you can't try. I, I can just tell you over, you know, over the years, you know, family members and others, you don't have that, you don't have that much time at all. You don't have any time because they don't want to hear the explanation. You got about 30 seconds at best, best. And if you have something that perks their interest, maybe you have another 30 seconds. You know. You know, not only that, you, you know, somebody there points out, you know, you mentioned other people, they think you're, you know, you're another planet. You're right. People thought I would come around years ago. And they just see him totally far gone. <laughs> Too far gone. They gave up. But see, the irony is, yeah, they gave up on me, you know, because I've gone too far, but it's not about ideology. That's not what the argument is. It's not about ideology. All it is, my Jews and non-Jews, just leave me alone. Life is hard enough. I don't want to take on any more responsibility. I just want to live life, and that's it. And when I die, I die and finish. How are you going to argue with that? Okay. You know, and then someone will say, well, we can agree to disagree. We didn't even have an argument. We didn't even have a discussion because you're too chicken livered. They have the discussion because you know I might be right. So it never comes up. So once in a while, I'll bring something up to certain people, whatever. But you don't have that. The, the point is, you know, they'll say, I'm so intelligent. You know, you're so close minded. Yeah. But they're not even willing to listen to what you have to say at all. You know, when someone, you know, someone can have an MBA, go to an Ivy League school, be really, really intelligent, and then at the same time say, you know, okay, life after death, give me 30 seconds. One of the most crucial questions in the history of man, right? Or how do you explain suffering to the Holocaust? Give me 10, I'll give you 15 seconds. What is this, beat the clock? You know, what is this, Jeopardy? What is, you're a moron. <laughs> That's the answer. What do you answer to that? You know, if I would if I were to say to somebody, a physicist, big time, you're going to take Stephen Hawking, you know, big time physicist, I said, can you explain to me, you know, quantum physics in about 35 seconds? What's he going to do? He's going to laugh. He's going to say, what, what, what do you think I am? You know, it's going to take me a while. I can understand this. It's going to sit in the back. No, I'm giving you 10 seconds. I'm not being intellectually honest. I'm telling you. They're not even going to give you two minutes. Forget two minutes. People I came in contact with, I don't even get 30 seconds. Not even 30 seconds. I'm lucky if I get 15 seconds. And then you got to think very quick, say something, you know, quirky or whatever to keep their attention. Because if not, you don't, you don't even have two minutes. You don't even have two minutes. Now, it's funny. You know, somebody mentioned, you know, people bring up Fiddle on the Roof. It's the worst movie ever. The worst play ever. It's all about assimilation into marriage. Oh, I saw Fiddle on the Roof. It has nothing to do with Judaism. It's about assimilation. I mean, I'm not saying does it. It's, you know, it's all about assimilation into marriage. Oh, I get it. It's all that. You know, you can't even answer that. The only thing you say is, yeah, whatever. And they're not holding by it. It goes nowhere. How if I they give you two minutes? Two minutes is a long time. You get a lot of information in two minutes, especially if you speak fast like me. You get a lot of information out there in two minutes. They won't give you two minutes. 
you, I'm, I'm saying, my experience has been, you are give you 15 seconds, 20 seconds. That's what it is. And, you, you know, and they're going to say, you know, I, I would tell people, and you can try this, you won't get anywhere either. Right? But, you know, you can tell people, listen, I have a lot of evidence of, of why what I'm doing and why it's true. You know, maybe I can send you some information. Oh, no. You're going to try and brainwash me. What are you afraid of? You might actually see the truth. Right? People are not intellectually honest. You, you, you won't even, you know, if you mention that and say, wow, I got great information. Someone will say, you know, where was God during the Holocaust? I got a great book. It's called Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. You want to read it? No. It's just a rabbi. You know, the question I ask Orthodox Jews makes them fidget. Not going to be interested. Right? These people are insane. 100%. 100%. A lot of these conversations, total waste of time. Some people, it may ring a bell. It may open them up a little bit. Most people, catch up on mustard on my hot dog. It's a waste of time. But if they ask you, you got to answer something. You should answer something. Right? But I'm just saying, you're not going to have that much time. You know, I think the quickest thing to say is, well, we believe God gave the Torah on Sinai, gave it to the Jewish people. Non-Jews didn't want it. Then I have to go through conversion. Right? And if I don't want to convert, I don't have to. I have to keep the universal laws. That's 10 seconds. Then they can ask, oh, what are the universal laws? How do you know that? Right? I think that's a very quick answer. Right? And that might be the end of the conversation. Right? They're like, oh, okay. They don't want to hear any more out. But I'm saying, like, it's, it's just ironic. You get people with, like, the greatest degrees, PhDs, pilot higher and deeper, or Papa has dough, whatever it is, and they sound like absolute idiots. You know, if they wanted, you know, if they were, you know, they're talking to a stockbroker. They want to know about a stock to invest in. You know, they're all ears. You know why they're all ears? Because they don't want to make money. They don't want to lose money. But this is all about life. They don't want to hear anything. They don't want to hear anything. So you can have the most intelligent people just stick their head in the sand like an ostrich. You know, they, they don't want any information. Oh, you're going to try and brainwash me. No, I'm going to re-educate you. I'll give you information. You want information? No. See, but that's the problem. People like that, they don't want the information. They don't want to hear. They want to, you know, they want to know if they put ketchup or mustard on the hot dog. So what are you arguing about? No, I'm, I'm just saying, if someone asks the question, you try and give them a very quick answer because that's all they can handle. It's called snappy questions, snappy answers. Right? And you answer them very quick because if you don't answer them quick, it's over. You lost them. How have I to have six minutes like a commercial? You don't have six minutes. You don't have two minutes. I'm telling you, you're lucky if you have 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And if you don't get it out in something good, very quick, you lost you know, you, you won't, they won't give you a second chance. You know, that's whatever. That, that's what it is. You know, um, you know, Gen Genesis and the Big Bang. <laughs> you know, the, the, the scientists say the earth is like 50 billion years old. And we say it's 57, you know, 80, 82 years old. Right, whatever it is. I, you know, how can you explain that? I'll give you 10 seconds. <laughs> de -de 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 -de. Come on. It shows obviously they're not serious. They may have the question, but they're not going to give you the time to that answer. Up, oh, time's up. Beat the clock. You lost. It's a joke. Right? So, I, you know, so part of me would say don't even engage the conversation. If they start with you, try and say something quick. You know, if they give you a little bit of time, embellish on it. They don't give you any time. You know, the waste of time in general. Because you're right. You're going to give them a little bit of information. They'll say, oh, you're already Jewish? Yeah, whatever. You know, and that's it. They won't give you any more. It is going to come up. People will say things. People will definitely say things. Right? You know, the, the question is, you know, if someone's really off the rails and they're saying all kinds of crazy things and that, then you have an obligation. You would have an obligation to say something. Question is, do I have to follow up with that? That's the whole question here. Do I have to follow up? And how far does it have to go? This is whatever. It's a much bigger, you know, it's a much bigger thing. You know, for Jewish outreach, 
you know, send them an invitation there, you know, video there, whatever. Every so often, I wouldn't, you know, like marketers do, I wouldn't send something every single day. You know, maybe every, you know, maybe once a week, once every three days, four days, just so they, you know, they don't get ticked off while you're spamming them or trying to convince them or whatever. Because then they'll tell you to stop sending stuff, okay? Question, but the, the, the question is, how far does that go? All right, so we mentioned, if this person you have this conversation with, you hit them. And they say, oh, I want to work Kabbalah, I want to do this. No, but you shouldn't do it for this reason, that reason. And you get an old discussion. Fine. Now, the question is, even if they're not going to listen and say, I don't care about the rabbis, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do whatever I want. Right? You know, you finish the conversation. I mean, you're friends with the person. So let's say two, three days later. Yeah, you know, you're, you're talking, whatever. You say, by the way, the thing you mentioned, whatever. You know, but do I have an obligation every single day trying to convince them this way, that way, the other way? I don't have an obligation. Non-Jews to non-Jews certainly don't have an obligation. Question is, how far does it work for a Jew and a Jew? Right? That, that's the question. Right? That, that was a question that um, was sort of thrown here. Right? Is how far do you have to go? Right? What's your responsibility? So I think I clarified that. There's another question here, but it's going to take too long to get through, which I'll probably do on Thursday. Um, yeah, any other questions? All right, then all the questions I'm going to sign out. I do this every Tuesday and Thursday, 10 o'clock Eastern time, 5 o'clock Israel time. Anyone has any questions, find me on Facebook, Beyond Orthodox Conversion Judaism, or Michael Chaim Kaufman, or you can send me an email, Rabbi Chaim Kaufman at gmail.com, R B B I C H A I M C O F F M A N at gmail.com. Whichever the good beginning of the day, middle of the day. Anyway, you are.